Welcome to our study of the fundamentals of operating systems. This series of lectures is based on the book Operating System Concepts, 10th edition by Silbershots, Galvin, and Gagne, and published by Wiley Publishing. In the last lesson, we were discussing mass storage systems. In this lesson, we're going to discuss the input-output devices that connect all these things together. So let's proceed. The control of devices connected to the computer is a major concern of operating system designers because input-output devices vary so much in their function and speed. For example, comparing a mouse to a hard drive, various methods are needed to control them. These methods form the input-output subsystem of the kernel, which separates the rest of the kernel from the complexities of managing those input-output devices. The input-output technology exhibits two conflicting trends. On the one hand, we are seeing increasing standardization of software and hardware interfaces. This trend helps us to incorporate improved device generations into existing computers and operating systems. On the other hand, we see an increasingly broad variety of input-output devices. Some new devices are so unlike previous devices that it's a challenge to incorporate them into our computers and operating systems. This challenge is met by the combination of hardware and software techniques. The basic input-output hardware elements, such as ports, buses, and device controllers, accommodate a wide variety of input-output devices. To encapsulate the details and oddities of different devices, the kernel of an operating system is structured to use device driver modules. I'm sure you have had to download an updated driver from time to time. These device drivers present a uniform device access interface to the input-output subsystem. Just like uh, system calls provide a standard interface between the application and the operating system. Computers operate a great many kinds of devices. Most fit into the general categories like storage devices and transmission devices like your network card and Bluetooth. And then human interface devices like your screens and keyboards and so on. Other devices are much more specialized, such as those involving the steering of a jet. In these aircraft, a human being gives input to the flight computer via a joystick and foot pedals, and the computer sends output commands that causes the motors to move rudders and flaps and fuels the engines and so on. Despite the incredible variety of input-output devices, though, we only need to understand a few concepts of how the devices are attached and how the software can control the hardware. A device communicates with a computer system by sending signals over a cable or even through the air. The device communicates with the machine via a connection point or a port, for example your serial port or that USB port. If the devices share a common set of wires, then that connection is called a bus. Now this is a typical PCI bus of a typical microcomputer. And if you've ever looked inside your case, you've seen attached to the bottom that bus on which all these devices are connected. A bus like this PCI bus is used in most computers today. It's a set of wires and a rigidly defined protocol that specifies a set of messages that can be sent on those wires. In terms of electronics, the messages are conveyed by a pattern of electrical voltages applied to the wires with defined timings. Now when device A has a cable plugged into device B, and device B has a cable plugged into device C, and device C plugs into a port on a computer, this arrangement is called a daisy chain. A daisy chain usually operates as a bus. Buses are used widely on computer architecture and vary in their signaling methods, speed, throughput, and connection methods. 
In this figure, the PCI bus connects the processor memory subsystems to FAST devices, and an expansion bus connects relatively slow devices, such as the keyboard and serial and USB ports. In the lower left-hand corner of the image here, there are four disks tied together on a SCSI bus plugged into an SAS controller. PCIe is a flexible bus that can send data over one or more lanes. A lane is composed of two signaling pairs, one pair for receiving data and the other pair for transmitting data. Each lane is therefore composed of four wires and each lane is used as a full duplex byte stream, transporting data packets in 8-bit byte format simultaneously in both directions. By the way, that's what full duplex means. The communication is in both directions simultaneously. Physically, PCIe links may contain 1, 2, 4, 8, 12, 16, or 32 lanes. In addition, the PCIe has gone through multiple generations, with more coming in the future. Therefore, a card might say PCIe Gen 3 X8, which means it works with Generation 3 of PCIe and uses 8 lanes. Such a device has a maximum throughput of 8 gigabytes per second. A controller has a collection of electronics that can operate a bus a port or a device. A serial port controller is just a simple device controller. It is a single chip or even part of a chip in the computer that controls the signals on the wires of a serial port. On the other hand, a fiber channel bus controller is not simple. Because fiber channel protocol is so complex and used in data centers rather than on PCs, the fiber channel bus controller is often implemented as a separate circuit board or host bus adapter that connects to a bus in the computer. It typically contains a processor, microcode, and some private memory to enable it to process the fiber channel protocol messages. Some devices have their own built-in controllers. If you look at a disk drive, you'll see a circuit board attached to one side. This circuit board is the disk controller. Actually, that example is a little bit dated. True, earlier hard disk drives did have a separate board connected to the side of the uh, case, and that was the controller. But on modern hard disk drives, that controller is actually built in inside the case. You really won't see it. This disk controller implements the disk side of the protocol for some kinds of connections, SAS and SATA, for example. It has microcode and a processor to do a number of tasks, it's like uh, bad sector mapping, prefetching, buffering, and caching. So how does the processor give commands and data to a controller to accomplish an input-output transfer? The controller has registers for data and control signals. The processor communicates with the controller by reading and sending bit patterns in these registers. Now you remember that a register is a high speed storage location and in this case this register is built into the controller. One way in which this communication can concur is with special input-output instructions that specify the transfer of a byte or a word to an input-output port address. The input-output instruction triggers bus lines to select the proper device and move bits into or out of device registers. Another approach is for the device to support memory mapped input output. In this case, the device control registers are mapped onto the address space of the CPU. The CPU executes requests using the standard data transfer instructions to read and write the data control registers at their mapped location in physical memory. 
In the past, PCs often used input-output instructions to control some devices and memory-mapped input-output to control others. This figure you see here on the right shows the usual input-output port addresses for PCs. The graphics controller has input-output ports for basic control operation, but the controller has a large memory map region to hold screen contents. A thread sends output to the screen by writing data into the memory mapped region. The controller generates the screen image based on the contents of this memory. This technique is simple to use. Also, writing millions of bytes to graphics memory is faster than issuing millions of input-output instructions. Therefore, over time, systems have moved toward memory mapped input-output. Today, most input-output is performed by device controllers using memory mapped input-output. Input-output device control typically consists of four registers called status, control, data in, and data out registers. As I said, the four registers are called status, control, data in, and data out registers. The data in registers is read by the host to get input. The data out register is written by the host to send output. The status register contains bits that can be read by the host. These bits indicate states, like uh, whether the current command has completed, whether a byte is available to be read from data in register, or maybe whether a device error has occurred. The control register can be written by the host to start a command or to change the mode of service. For example, a certain bit in the control register of a serial port chooses between full duplex and half duplex communication. Another bit enables parity checking. Another bit sets the word length to 7 or 8 bits. And other bits select one of the speeds supported by the serial port. The data registers are typically 1 to 4 bytes in size. Some controllers have FIFO chips, that's first in first out chips, that can hold several bytes of input and output data to expand the capacity of the controller beyond the size of the data register. A FIFO chip can hold a small burst of data until the device or host is able to receive those data. Well, let's just stop right here. Uh, go back and review your notes, update your study guide, and when you're done, come on back and we will actually finish this unit on input output devices with lesson two.